Welcome back. I hope you have had a lot of coffee. So, um, yes, quick recap. We were discussing uh, blah, 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 variational states, right? Like we encode, we compress the with function down into some variational ansatz or neural network, any actually, if you think of a neural network just as a, a, a some parameterized uh, function, then I'm just compressing it, like my wave function down into a parameterized uh, function, of, it depends on some parameters, and I optimize those parameters, and I always need to find some loss function whose minima or maxima, some extrema, gives me the parameters that represent, encode the state I'm interested in, right? So in this case, I showed you how we can find the ground state by minimizing the energy. So I use the energy as a loss function. I minimize the energy, and I use this formula for the gradient. I said that by using Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, we can always rewrite all those brackets, all those quantum expectation values as classical expectation values over some probability distribution that I can sample classically. And so I, the compression into a parameterized function solves the memory problem, while Monte Carlo sampling solves the runtime or computational complexity problem. And of course, I still need to find the good parameters, and this I do by optimization. And with those ingredients, you can recast any, let's say, or many algorithms in uh, quantum physics and computational quantum physics down to optimization problems. You always need to find an optimization problem whose minima or maxima is the state you're interested in. Okay, so now I would like to say a few things about this estimator, right? How do we compute it in practice? Because that's quite important, not only for what we do, but also if you ever want to do something else in this spirit or in very different spirit by using machine learning and automatic differentiation. So, actually, let's start with this one. How do we do it in practice, right? So what happens? I, I do Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. I get, let's say, a bunch of configurations Xi, right? So this I could think of, if I have to do it on a computer, this is some sort of array, right, of dimensions, I don't know, some R, and this will have dimension number of samples times uh, number of spins. Do you agree? Yes, clear for everyone? Please stop. Good, then I can compute this H lock, so this local estimator, right? So now this local estimator, for every one of those samples, it's a scalar, so this will be a vector of size, number of samples. Do you agree with that? Amazing. So, and then I just take the average, right? Numpy dot mean, and I'm happy. How do we compute this gradient? So here I have H log of X. Uh, no, so first, let me say another thing. So this is an expectation value, right? So I can, again, take the sample mean, like I did before. So I can replace this expectation value with just a sum over a set of samples. So I will approximate it with one over number of samples, sum over I, which runs over my, my samples, right, from one to number of samples, of d theta star log psi theta xi times h log of xi minus this expectation value as well, which I will approximate it with the mean of h log. like before, okay? Is this clear? Yes. So, in the spirit of clarity, I can rename or rebrand this blob as delta H log of Xi, okay? So now my formula reads as something like one over number of samples, sum over i from one to number of samples of d theta star log psi theta of xi times delta 
h log of xi, right? Delta h log of xi is still a vector of size number of samples. What is this? So the gradient is a vector, right? So in a sense, the gradient of theta of e, theta, should be some, okay, it's a vector in the tangent space. Let's say, let's not deal with all the details. It's in a sense a vector of size, it's a row vector, if I'm not mistaken, of size one, or let's see, yeah, uh, number of parameters. Is this clear? I write one comma number of parameters because it's a row vector. I right, could just as well, maybe just simpler, right, it's a number of parameters, okay? Good. So what is this? Psi theta of xi is a vector. Sorry, psi theta of xi is a scalar. So I can also think of this, instead of putting my notation, right, for d theta star, I could also write it as some people might prefer it, like d theta star, right? So, this is a vector. I'm running, I'm, here I'm contracting over the dimension i. Out of this blob, I get a vector. So this is a matrix, right? So I can think of this as some sort of, like one over an s, let's forget it for a moment. Here I have delta h log one, delta h log and samples, okay, this is a vector. And here, like the dimension I'm contracting, I will have uh, d theta star one of log psi of x one, blah, 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 d theta one star log psi x n. And here I have d theta number of parameters star log psi x1, d theta number of parameters star log psi of xn. Do you agree? And if I contract this matrix times this vector, I get essentially what I'm looking for, which, doing it backwards, will be essentially sum of i of the theta one star log psi of x i times that, okay, I'm writing too small for you, I'm sorry. This is sum over i of the um, theta one log psi of x one delta h log of x i, sorry, i. And here, the sum over i, the, in, the theta number of parameters. Okay, is it clear? Are you following? Okay. So this is a, vector, a matrix vector product. Now, what matrix is this? So every row is a grade, sorry, every column is a, is a gradient, right? Because the first column is the gradient with respect to all the, par all the partial derivatives with respect to the first input, x1. And the last column is the, partial, is the gradient with respect to the last xn, the last input, correct? So this is a Jacobian, no? Like transpose, right? So for those that don't remember, the Jacobian ij is actually, so the it's the gradient of some function, the, the Jacobian ij is actually the partial derivative of the output i with respect to some parameter j of some function, right? So here I have the gradient of f1, the gradient of f and uh, s, let's say, and this becomes like the f1 in the theta1, the f one in the theta number of parameters, the f and s over the theta one, etc. Is this clear? So, how do we compute this in practice? 
if you were awake during a Lishka class, uh, she said, uh, we can use automatic differentiation to compute gradients, correct? So what you can do is you can start building this ma Jacobian matrix. Actually, this is a Jacobian transpose, right? Because the, the gradients are vertically aligned. So I can take my first input, x1. I can do automatic differentiation and get the gradient. And then I can do it for the second, grade, for the second input. I can do it for the third input. I do for every sample I have collected. Then I, and then I build my Jacobian, and I take this. I contract it with a vector. OK? Good. So now question. How expensive is this? So how many forward passes? And how many backward passes do I need to do? Anyone? Come on. Someone? I don't buy it. Y and square? No. What? Guys, speak up. Yes. So I have to do, exactly, correct. I have to do one forward pass for every sample. I have to evaluate my neural network for every sample. And I have to back propagate to compute one gradient for every, for every sample. So I will do n for a number of samples forward passes and then number of samples backward passes. OK? OK. Now comes what I believe to be the biggest lie of automatic differentiation in, uh, let's say, common culture, assuming common culture is, let's say, first year of university. Now, gradients are not the fundamental building blocks of automatic differentiation. So for curiosity, how many of you are aware of that? Nobody? Kind of, someone. OK. So gradients are just one thing that automatic differentiation does very well. It's what everyone built into TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, et cetera. But internally, this is not what they work with. OK? Because gradients only work for scalar functions. Instead, usually I give a one-hour class on this, so I will just be very quick. What the fundamental building block of automatic differentiation is the product between a Jacobian and a vector. OK? Because internally, in all but except the last layer where you get a real number, like, like a scalar, you will always work with vector output, so you need to work with Jacobians. So actually, what automatic differentiation does efficiently is to compute this contraction here. It never builds the Jacobian itself. It just does Jacobians times a vector. And the way it gives you the gradient, actually, internally, so if you look into PyTorch code, if you are, I don't know, a bit crazy, and, uh, or you want to heart yourself, probably. Now, if you want to heart, look at the TensorFlow one, but OK. So if you look at the gradient with respect to theta of a function, which is scalar, actually, the way it is implemented is by taking the Jacobian times 1. OK? Actually, OK, technically, Jacobian transpose, uh, yes. OK? And this is not because they are crazy. But it's because internally, everything is built in terms of those Jacobian vector products. OK? And this is because the efficient operation to do is Jacobian vector products. By the way, if you are a fan of differential geometry, this is exactly a push forward and, sorry, a pullback. Because you look at the like, a gradient is essentially looking at how like, a small perturbation in the output space is caused by a perturbation in the input space. That's why backward differentiation, pull back. By the way, push forward, aka forward mode automatic differentiation, is doing the opposite, is instead of taking Jacobian transpose, is doing Jacobian times a vector, which means you look at how a wobble, like a, a small perturbation in the input space, causes a perturbation of the output space. By the way, in this terms, it's super easy to understand why, if you have a many input one output function, you want to do backward mode differentiation. It's because if you want to compute the gradient by forward mode differentiation, you would have to feed every uh, canonical basis element, so every, every 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So you, you want to look at the perturbations of every independent direction in the input. 
Instead, if you do backward mode differentiation, you just say what has caused a unit perturbation of the output, and you get the gradient in one go, okay? If you want to understand this, it's one reference I gave at the beginning, this uh, uh, a differential geometric view of automatic, of higher order automatic differentiation, section one by Bettencourt, explains it very cleanly. Because automatic differentiation is deeply connected to differential geometry, which is beautiful. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is that if you compute gradient by gradient, row by row, you will have to do number of samples backward propagation. So number of samples, Jacobian vector products, okay? Actually, please, I don't want to get into the why, but this is also called vector Jacobian product, okay? Because Jacobian vector, you transpose this again, so you have a vector transpose Jacobian, okay? But vector Jacobian or push pullback. So, so if you want to do this by just using PyTorch.grad, you will have to have a scalar function, so you do this for every row, for every different sample. Result, number of samples pullbacks. You build the matrix, you have to store in memory this Jacobian, and then you contract it with a vector. Instead, if you use the thing that actually it is built upon, so the pullback, so this vector Jacobian product, you simply tell him, I want the Jacobian of this function. Now, this is the function that takes as input all the, all the samples and gives you as an output the vector of, uh, of uh, amplitudes. And you ask it, what's the Jacobian of this? You don't ask it what's the Jacobian of this, uh, of this fu vector function, but you ask him, give me the pullback of this function for this vector. So contract the Jacobian with this vector, okay? So here you have one pullback. Is it clear? So I know it might be counterintuitive, but every time you think, you reason, in terms of uh, algorithms that use automatic differentiation, you should not count the gradients you evaluate, but you should count the pullbacks or push forwards you perform. This is what gives you the performance. If you want to understand, read that reference, okay? So this is, like, this is really the important point. And this is a fight I have with colleagues sometimes because they tell me, oh, I found an amazing algorithm, blah, 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 and I tell them, no, this will have the same performance as what we do because the bottom line is uh, we care about pullbacks, the number of pullbacks we do. This is also very important for practical reasons. Let me tell you a story. A few years ago, we were rewriting NetKit into, from a C++, C++ hand-coded stuff down into Python. And we scouted the different packages that there were. So we had PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX was beginning to come out. And we were looking at, at this formula, and uh, we had not understood yet this uh, story of Jacobian vector products completely, but we tried to implement everything in PyTorch, and so we had to take a number of samples gradients. And it was much lower than our code in C. We were not sure why. Then we implemented it in JAX, huh? by using this vector Jacobian trickery, and it was as fast, well, actually even faster than the C++ one. And then slowly we understood all this story, that the performance bottleneck, and the performance is given by how many pullbacks you do. So at that point, we started to say, great, we will do everything in JAX. And at the time, we had some contacts with meta engineers at Facebook, and, they told, and some of them were physicists, and they were, they were very keen on uh, machine learning for quantum physics. And so they wanted us to rewrite it in PyTorch. And, uh, and we had a discussion with them, and they asked us, why can't you do it? And we said, we want this. And they told us, ah, it's hard. Because internally, they do it, but they, it was super hard to expose it to users. And they told us, well, we will soon do it. This was during the pandemic. They told us, in two months, we will have it, we will give you a preliminary thing, and you can check it out. Well, they sent us another email three months later telling us that it was harder than they thought, and they sent a follow-up email two years and a half later in 2022 saying, we finally done it. It's called torch.fx. And uh, in the meantime, well, we moved on. So 
and now PyTorch and everyone else is also starting to expose these things because if you want to express anything that is not a standard uh, machine learning algorithm where you minimize the loss, uh, but when, where you do something more crazy by using automatic differentiation every time you have a gradient or every time you have to compute Jacobians, you can go really crazy with the algorithms you implement. Like neural differential equations require this and many other algorithms require this. So keep this in mind, okay? Good. And story moving. So in the end, when you want to implement this stuff efficiently, you always want to express it in terms of Jacobian vector products. Good. So how do you do it? Well, simply you take, you treat your function, your, your wave function as just a vector function that takes many samples in and gives you many outputs. And then you, you don't have a, vec, a gradient anymore well defined, you have a Jacobian, and you just do this Jacobian vector product. Actually, vector Jacobian product, because it's a pullback. Okay, is it clear? This might seem a technicality, but it's actually super important if you ever find yourself in the shoes of someone who wants to design an algorithm where you use some ideas from machine learning, okay? Remember this, good. Having said that, so now we know how to compute this gradient and then we can do everything very fancy. We use JAX, PyTorch, whatever. We get the gradient, we do gradient descent, right? And for gradient descent, you can actually do just the gradient. So you take, I don't know, uh, you have your parameters theta at time t, and you compute the new parameters at t plus one by taking theta of t minus some learning rate times the gradient of, of the energy. Or you can read into the machine learning literature about all those fancy optimizers like Adam, like uh, Ada Belief, uh, like Ada Max, like all those Adas everywhere, uh, which stands for adaptive, uh, if you didn't know. Um, and you can try to find what's the best one. General Adam works very well. It means adaptive momentum, so it's, it's kind of gradient descent with some momentum, but you can use also the others, okay? And you try them. Problem is, those are all first order approximation methods. They break down. And I know I told you not to look at this picture, but what happens when I get stuck there, right? So it turns out that there's a way to rephrase this optimization problem in such a way that it's much simpler. If instead of taking the gradient with respect to the parameters, I take the variations with respect to the wave function itself, this is a quadratic problem, and I know how to compute the optimal steps and to converge exponentially fast. Do you understand why? Is it clear for everyone? Like, this is a quadratic problem, so it's the simplest problem that mathematicians love. So if, if I can take the gradient with respect to psi itself, which I can't, but if I could I, I could, I would be able to find the solutions very fast. I mean, assuming this system is gapped. So can I, can I devise an algorithm where I, I follow this gradient, actually, and I just remap it back in, in the variation space afterwards? And this is what I'm going to discuss now. It's called, um, in the language of physicists, uh, stochastic uh, reconfiguration. In the language of machine learning people, it's called natural gradient descent. And uh, the beauty of it is that it's uh, asymptotically, assuming my neural network can represent all the intermediate states, uh, it has guaranteed convergence. Of course, in practice, it's not the case, but in theory it is. So, how do we do it? So, I will do a derivation that is more, uh, let's say, affine, attuned to physicists, which is to express this, uh, let's say, quadratic uh, problem descent in terms of imaginary time evolution. So, essentially, I will define the state psi, t, psi at time tau to be some e to the minus h tau of some c zero, okay? So in a sense, so, okay, if I want to be very precise following my previous notation, I should write it as where the dependence is in the parameters, okay? So now I assume my parameters are somehow time dependent or step dependent. This is what I would like to do. 
So of course, uh, this is a state, this is an NQS, so let's say some random initial state, and I can apply this object, but then I need to project it back into the variational manifold. I need this object is not an error quantum state anymore, I need to represent it as an error quantum state again. How do I do that? Well, let's do it step by step. So let's consider a, a small time step, d tau, okay, such that I can linearize this exponential. So I will write this as identity minus d tau, but let's just call it tau, otherwise, I, I mean, you understand. Assume that tau is small, h psi theta, okay? And now, I want to find a way to change my parameter, theta plus theta dot tau, okay? So I want to find a differential equation, a way to change my variational parameters that matches this representation. In a sense, if you want, I'm trying to go from d c over d tau equal minus h c to some d theta over d tau equal some question mark of theta. Do you understand? I want to remap my dynamics from the Hilbert space, which is uh, unbearably large, to some, to some differential equation in my variational space. To do that, I will try just to find the update rule for one time step, okay? Because I don't know how to do better. And so here, I have theta plus theta dot tau. And um, yes. So what do I do? Well, to, to do this derivation, I will need to do another assumption, which is to linearize this, to assume that only first order variations are considered. So I will approximate this with, uh, let's say, um, identity plus but if you want, I can approximate this as psi theta plus uh, d delta, no, sorry, um, theta dot, which is a vector, dot tau dot uh, d theta, which is also a vector, psi theta to u plus order of tau square. Is it clear? Yes. Good. So, first, uh, first things first, let's do this one. So this is psi theta plus delta theta, blah, 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 blah. So I can write it as, in a sense, as identity plus tau theta dot tau d theta Right, those are vectors I might forget at some point to write it down, psi theta, and I will stop writing this big O of tau square, okay? Then the other term, and okay, sorry, and this, this will change norm, right? This state is no longer, has, no longer has the same norm. So in the spirit of trying to write something that has a constant norm, I can also try to compute psi theta plus theta dot tau, which will simply be this object here squared. It will be psi theta identity plus tau theta dot uh, star. Remember, I do all calculations assuming complex numbers. Psi theta, correct? And this quantity here will be, well, psi theta, uh, sorry, and this is under a square root. So this is psi theta, psi theta, times one, plus, uh, up to first order in tau, I will only consider uh, uh, tau, the real part of, theta dot d tau uh, okay let me do a full calculation sorry yes 
process. I will get terms, essentially the mixed term here, first order in the tau, it will be something psi theta, day theta star, psi theta, for example. This one, I can write it as, uh, if you remember this d tau, this d theta star should apply to the left because to the right it, it, it can, it's zero. So this will be d theta psi theta psi theta, right? But this, uh, I can also write it, if you remember, we did it to compute the gradient, this first term here uh, is d log theta psi. This, uh, we can also write it in some way by inserting an identity here as sum over x of d theta psi theta x, x psi theta, and essentially, I can write it as um, sum over x of p theta of x times psi theta psi theta times the log psi theta of x. Do you agree? And now, if I call this object simply O, this is a bit yeah, messy. If I call this O, O star of X, just a name for simplicity, if you want, I can simply call this psi theta, psi theta times expectation value of O theta. Okay? So if you want, I can imagine this object is, a, is sort of like a, a diagonal operator, but I'm, I'm, I'm bracketing between psi theta. Is it clear? Because this, is, this only depends on x, so it's like an operator on the diagonal. Here I have psi theta square, which comes from bracketing psi theta, psi theta. So if you want another way to see this is essentially have psi theta, psi theta, psi theta, o theta, psi theta, okay? If you want. Yeah, maybe it was easier to just write it that way, to say that, to call this object o. Yes, sorry. It's much easier, maybe. Okay? So in that way, I can kind of say that here I have one plus tau, real part of this expectation value of o theta, uh, times theta dot plus uh, higher order times, right? So I can always compute, you see, I can always compute this normalization if needed. And I could also compute the normalization of the state that has been evolved for a small time step by h. And essentially the change of norma will be induced by h itself, basically by the energy. The higher the energy, the larger the change of norm. Is it clear? Good. So now, what can we ask ourselves? We can try to match those two states. I can ask myself, what is the theta dot such that I minimize the distance between uh, this, this state, right, so e to the minus h tau psi theta and uh, psi theta plus theta dot tau. Yes? And I'm looking for the theta dot that minimizes this distance. I perform two approximations. The first one is to linearize this one, and the second is to, uh, with respect to tau, and the second one is to linearize with respect to the parameters. I also need to pick a distance. There's many distances that can be taken. You can, if you want to read about it, you can read the theory of 
variational time evolution on the archive. The last author is Benjamin. And we discussed different choices for the distance. In the end, what, what turns out is that for closed systems or unitary dynamics, uh, different choices of the distance don't really matter, in particular modulo some tiny details that are not important, and in particular if your parameters are complex, like the equations you get are really exactly the same. And so the question you might ask yourself is, can I match those two quantities, okay? So for example, what we can do is we can take some sort of L2 distance or minimize some sort of fidelity between those states. And if we do that, we will get something like some distance between identity minus tau h psi theta minus the other object, right, which is identity plus to theta dot the theta psi theta. Okay? And of course I will want to do this arc mean. Okay. Okay? So please consider if I want to solve this problem. Here, I perform two, two approximations. One is to linearize this, and the second is to linearize the neural network. So the first one can be physically motivated if I take a small time step. It makes sense, it's reasonable. The second one, though, it's a bit tricky because the power of neural networks stems from the fact that they are highly nonlinear, and so they can compress the wave function efficiently. Now I'm saying, well, let's consider variations where the neural network is behaving as a linear function. Nicky, nicky, right? It's a bit problematic. Turns out that essentially we're saying this problem, this, this algorithm that I get, uh, will work well and will require me to take steps uh, that are such that the time step I choose must be small enough that my, my neural network in parameter space behaves almost linearly, okay? Otherwise, it will break down. But I also hope to use a nonlinear neural network because, of course, I want to compress states efficiently. So it's, uh, it's very, very hard to use whatever algorithm will come out of this because I will need to choose tau such that it is very small. We could, however, have not performed this linearization in tau. What, will, what would happen in that case is that we get an optimization problem. It, it, we cannot get a closed form as I will show you now and uh, I would need to, to take a different path in a sense. But performing both those approximations, if I take this object, I take the difference, right? And so the, the identity term, the first order terms, uh, term disappears and I get something like argmin over theta dot of tau h applied to psi theta minus tau theta dot the theta psi theta squared, okay? And if I, if I now, if I get tau out of, out of equation, because anyway it doesn't affect the arc mean in any way, what happens is that I'm taking the arc mean of theta dot, of the quantity, I can square everything here, I get psi theta, h square, psi theta, then I get um, a mixed term here, so I get plus uh, theta dot uh, i, a theta i, sorry, star, the theta i star, d theta j, psi theta, theta j, dot. And here I assume an Einstein summation, so I'm summing over i and j, which was here in some sort of dot product, right? Um, minus a cross term, which will be something like uh, psi theta, d theta star, h psi theta, 
eta dot. So here I have I and I, again, Einstein summation minus it, and this is star, again, sorry, theta dot I, psi theta H, the theta, psi theta. Is it okay for everyone? So here, please beware, if I were to do this calculation correctly, I should also include the normalization that I showed you before. Both just give rise to extra terms, uh, but the idea of the calculation is exactly the same. It's just much more annoying to do it on the blackboard. But if you look at the lecture notes, you will find all the details. Okay, so I have this quantity. Now I want to find the theta dot, right, that satisfies this condition. So first of all, this object here doesn't depend on theta dot. So I can forget it, right? I can drop it. Now, how do I find the theta dot that minimizes this equation? I have another object that doesn't depend on theta dot. It's this one, because it depends on theta dot star. If you remember before, assuming holomorphicity and everything, I can treat theta and theta star as independent variables. So this I can drop it as well. So in, in the end, if I want to find the minima, it means I can take the derivative with respect to theta dot, right? So if I call this, I don't know, uh, L of theta dot, what I'm asking is that I stationarize this, uh, so I, I take the derivatives uh, with respect to theta dot of this function are zero, right? That's why, in a sense, I can drop all the terms that don't depend on theta dot. And so this condition, what does it give me? It simply gives me theta dot star i of psi theta, d theta i, d theta j, psi theta, will be equal to psi theta h, d theta, psi theta, okay? Is it good? So essentially, to, to find the minimum, so the theta dot that satisfies this constraint, that essentially I take the, 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 the direction that the imaginary time evolution would give me and project it down to what I can represent as variations in my, in, in my space of variational parameters. I need to minimize this distance, and to minimize this distance, essentially, I can just take the derivative of this distance with respect to those variations, and I can set it to zero. Okay, and so let me call this quantity Sij, okay, which is uh, uh, using the notation, it could be d theta i psi theta, d theta j psi theta, okay? And calling this object Fi, which is psi theta h, d theta i psi theta, okay? What I found is that this differential equation will be such that theta dot must respect this equation, theta dot s uh, theta i s i j is equal to f. Yes. Blah, blah, blah theta dot star, in a sense. Yes, okay? And then I can just take the conjugate of everything, and since S is Hermitian, this doesn't matter, so I can just write, in the end I can write it that way. Okay, so basically I have a matrix, I have a vector, those are objects like that, which we already discussed, right? We can always compute them by Monte Carlo sampling, and then I just need to integrate this differential equation. Well, even though, let's say, now I did a bit of mess, I think, but the way we usually write it is just by saying S, which is a matrix, time theta dot is equal to F, where F is a vector, okay? And so how do we solve that? Well, theta dot is equal to S to the minus one F, okay? 
And this, minus, this matrix, of, of course, I mean the pseudo inverse because it might be singular. Is it clear so far? So essentially said, if, and, and so now I, I kind of answer this question, right? So this t, the theta over the tau will actually be this uh, s to the minus one, which of course depends on theta, f tau, okay? So if I want to integrate my differential equation that tells me how to converge to the ground state by doing imaginary time evolution, I simply need to compute s theta and f theta, do solve this linear system of equation, and I get my updates. I do this many times, I do the dynamics, I'm happy. Now, f theta, it's actually possible to show it that uh, if we perform the full calculation with nor the normalization, this object is actually identical to the gradient of the energy. And S also has a very similar, has kind of this form minus another term. So F is actually a gradient of the energy, so it's like a vector of size number of parameters, right? Because here I have the I index is actually D theta I, so it's the partial derivative with respect to every Compo every parameter, while Sij is a matrix number of parameters by number of parameters. Is it clear? Yes. So this technique, which is called stochastic reconfiguration, can also be used, by the way, to do the dynamics in real time. I could simply add an I here, right? And then I, I just get I's a bit everywhere, and actually I just get an I somewhere here, okay? Good. And machine learning people call something very, that gets to the same equations but starts from a different assumptions at the beginning, natural gradient descent. Because what is this doing? The S matrix, this d theta psi, d theta psi, can be seen as a metric tensor of my Hilbert space, of my variational space. So, well, actually, let me, uh, yes. Yeah, so let, let's see this for a, let's see this if you want. No, uh, yeah, in a sense, I w this is, uh, write it down, it's an exercise I leave to yourself if you want to do it. But you can actually prove that psi theta plus delta theta and psi theta, okay, the distance between those two states can be written as d theta star daga s d theta. Okay, so the distance between two states uh, and where distance uh, actually is the Fubini study distance uh, between those two states. So Fubini study essentially is something related to the fidelity of the two states, so it's a physically motivated distance. You can show that this, Fubini, this distance can be, this distance between the two states can be written in terms of this product, okay? Now, if you remember, how do I compute the distance between two vectors, uh, let's say, if I have x plus epsilon and y in the Euclidean space? Well, it's simply epsilon, right, dot identity dot epsilon, correct? Do you agree? I take the distance of two vectors and I simply square it by the metric tensor, and for Euclidean manifolds, the metric tensor is the identity. Instead, here, the metric tensor is not the identity, it's this S matrix. Why? Because the distance between two wave functions, of course, should be given by some sort of infidelity or Hilbert-Schmidt norm, huh? let's say. I don't want to use the Euclidean distance that, has, that is embedded in the Euclidean manifold of parameters. This is not interesting. I could have two neural networks that encode two quantum states that are identical, but have the different parameters. Or vice versa, I could have two neural networks that are completely different, that are encoded by parameters that are very close together. You understand? I mean, that was saying yes, but of course he understands for why. I mean, that works for me. Okay, so. So this S matrix is really just telling me how to compute distances according to the physically informed distance. So according to the Hilbert-Schmidt norm or actually Fubini study, but they are somewhat equivalent. But, but I only know in the distance in, in terms of vectors in the parameter space, okay? So it's somehow a way to connect uh, different manifolds that represent the same objects, okay? 
And if you're interested in differential geometry, you can actually read a lot about natural, a, a geometric view of, different, of natural gradient descent because this S matrix is related to pullbacks and push, push forwards uh, and, um, and, and there's a deep interpretation to it, though it would take hours to discuss. Good. So this is just, uh, this S matrix tells you essentially how to change the metric and this is why here I'm inverting it in a sense in this differential equation. By inverting this S matrix, I'm in a sense taking the gradient of the energy, which is computed according to the distance function that is given by, by the Euclidean metric of my parameters, of the space of parameters, and I'm pulling it back to the space of theta, so to the, sorry, to the space of wave functions. So in a sense, I'm trying to take the gradient computed according to the distance of the, to the Euclidean distance and changing it to some Hilbert-Schmidt distance, okay? This is a bit a fuzzy picture, doing, it, doing the proof analytically would, would require quite a bit of time. But you can find it if you look at the original paper uh, on natural gradient descent by Amari in 1999, you can find this proof. Okay, so now, how do we do this in practice? Well, it turns out, but if you do all the calculations, also assuming, uh, um, also assuming uh, the, the normalizations, you will get this expression for Sij. You will get uh, di psi by d theta i, d theta j psi divided by psi psi. I always assume that everything depends on theta, minus di psi dj psi divided by psi psi. Sorry. Um, di psi 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 dj psi and uh, f i is psi h di psi divided by psi psi minus e times psi the psi divided by psi psi, okay? So if you look at this form, it's exactly the same as this one, just with a conjugate, okay? Because psi h, right? If I shove in here an identity, I get something that looks like sum over x of psi h x x the i psi, right? And then I can just multiply by psi of x square. So here I get my local energy, here I get my log derivative, and then I have a normalization. Correct? Do you agree? Do notice that here there is the i psi, so this is not exactly the same quantity. There is a conjugation in, in between, but again. And here I have the energy, as I have there, and this is the over the second term, right? So this, is, this can be written again as a covariance. Do you agree? Good. Well, this S matrix, how do I, how do I compute it? Well, again, I know it gets boring. If it gets boring, this is good because you understood the gist of it. I plug an identity in here, right? And I get something that looks like sum over x of d i psi x x d j psi. And then what do I do? Anyone? Not Amedeo. Yes, someone was talking. Yes. I mean, guys, some voice, please. Huh? But I think I heard the multiply and divide by psi of x squared. Yes. Right? And then, of course, I also have a normalization. But as always, I don't know how to deal with. But luckily, this is an expectation value. And so it becomes expectation value of x over psi of x squared of d theta i, but d i, let me write it like that, log psi uh, d theta i star log psi theta of x, d theta j 
log psi of x. Okay? Now, do you remember my delucubrations about, is it even a word? I don't know, but about uh, the nodes uh, and psi of x not being zero. Here I'm not allowed to divide it, right? Because the wave function might be zero and I don't have a psi of x that saves me. So again, do notice that here I'm not allowed to do it. Yet I do it, okay? This is important. At least I think it's important. We need to keep it in mind. Good, so now we, we have this expectation value here. I simply take the Jacobian, I contract it with the Jacobian transpose again, okay? And the second term here, well, I know it's boring, this becomes some sum of the i psi x, x psi, right? I square this, I get the psi of x in here, and then oh, it's also an expectation value, right? And so this is also a covariance. Is it clear or do you want me to do the calculation? This is also an expectation value like that one. And so since those are two different products, I, I can assume this is one sampling and this is, a, this is one expectation value times another expectation value, right? So, well, let's quickly show it. So this becomes, so the first term I wrote it down there, right? The i, d theta i star log psi, well, actually it's d i log psi of x, of x star, because I start the theta in the derivative and log psi theta here is starred as well because it was a bra. So it's everything starred, d j log psi of x minus expectation value, always on the same distribution of this first term here. So it's what? It's d i log psi of x, everything starred, times another expectation value that comes from this one and from that one of d i, d j, sorry, log psi of x. And all those expectation values are from the same probability distribution, right? Do you agree? I hope you do. And so, you see, here I have the same term, d i log psi star. So this is again a covariance, for those of you who like statistics. So I can write this as a covariance of x sample from p theta of x of d i log psi star of x and d j, sorry, everything starred, d j log psi of x, okay? By the way, here I need the Jacobian, the full Jacobian. So in principle, to know this Jacobian, I need to do number of samples times uh, back propagations, right? It's a discussion I did before. Because I'm not contracting the Jacobian with a vector. It's just the Jacobian. Okay? There are details about it if you are interested. So in the appendix of the NetCAD paper, uh, appendix uh, B, I think, we discuss how it's also possible to rewrite such expression in terms of vector Jacobian and Jacobian vector products, which again give you a number of uh, sample speed up and it can be used to have a large speed up. Okay? Good. So I told you how we compute the S matrix, the F vector, the forces, and now I simply need to invert this matrix. Okay? This matrix is number of parameters squared. So what do you think is the largest matrix I can invert on a computer? Roughly. Did anyone try to invert a large matrix? Uh, you know, come on. I know you know. Someone else. Someone, like, what is your guess? From someone who doesn't invert matrices all day long. Okay, please. What? I disagree. Ah, you can invert quickly 10,000 by 10,000 matrices. Okay, 
if you have a, if you have a fat GPU, you probably can invert, let's say, 30,000, 40,000 by 40,000 in one minute, roughly, on the top of the line, very expensive uh, GPUs, okay? So, and, and the inversion algorithm grows cubically, right? So if I add more and more, if I double the number of parameters, the time that it takes will increase actually by eight times. So I, I, this is not ideal, right? So in the, like using this algorithm where I have to invert this S matrix, well, it's, it will actually be very expensive because if, like we kind of know that neural networks are very powerful when I have a lot of parameters. And if I told you that I, I, 30,000 by 30,000 takes a minute, which means to do one step of this imaginary time evolution will take a minute plus other things, well, it's tough. So a few years ago, when we were not super smart people working on this, we kind of said, well, wait a moment. We can, what we are actually doing here, we are solving this linear algebra problem, S theta dot equal F. So you don't actually need to invert the matrix. You can just solve this linear algebra problem. And there are several very efficient algorithms, like conjugate gradients, uh, mean res, uh, and uh, by, by CG and other stuff. But essentially are iterative algorithms. So they don't build the inverse. They kind of treat this as some quadratic problem. They, they, they apply S to some test vector and they iteratively find the solution. But those algorithms also can, don't give you the exact solution. They give you an error, but they scale more like quadratically, let's say. However, if your S matrix is very singular, so has many zero eigenvalues, they can break down. But we used those for a long time, and there were big discussions between the school of thought of me and the school of thought of uh, Marcus, who is not here, who, uh, who argued whether we should use those iterative solvers or just invert it, and there, there was a, a, funny, a funny scientific disagreement on how to do that. But that's just us having fun. One year ago, the other Marcus, Marcus Heil, who is an organizer of this conference, actually had a very good idea with his student, Ao Chen. He said, we don't need to invert this matrix. Instead of building a number of sample square matrix, we can exploit some properties of this matrix to construct a much smaller matrix. And this has skyrocketed us to amazing results that were obtained in the last year. So, how did he do it? Oh, this is a mess. So, let me give you an intuitive explanation. So allow me to simplify a bit the notation, otherwise it's super hard to get. So this notation is complicated. Let me write um, this, ba, 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 this gradient here. You see? I wrote it like a Jacobian vector product, right? You agree? So allow me to write this as J, uh, I said J transpose, right? Yes, but let's just call it J, and I'll define what Jacobian means, times epsilon, okay? So epsilon is a vector, what I call delta H, okay? And J is the log derivatives. Is it clear? So from now on, I will define f to be equal to j times epsilon, okay? The reason I do this is because it compresses the notation and allows you to see things that otherwise are very hidden away. And now the S matrix, I will call it j daga j, okay? So the Jacobian is actually, by Jacobian is actually this minus the average. You can do a lot of math, but that's the idea, right? It's just the Jacobian Daga Jacobian. So now, what are the shapes of those objects? So Jacobian is actually something, number of parameters by number of samples, and epsilon is the vector of local energy, so it's something like number of samples, right? So here you are contracting the inner dimension, so the number of samples, there is a problem, like this, okay? Because here I'm contracting the number of samples dimension, while here I'm, and here I'm also contracting the number of samples I mentioned, right? 
So my solution, my theta dot, is actually s to the minus 1 f, which means it's Jacobian, Jacobian dagger to the minus 1 Jacobian epsilon. So here I'm contracting something that is a number of parameters. Do you agree with this? Is it clear? I'm compressing the notation. So you can try to see it by yourself if you want later, but is it kind of clear the idea? So do you know what kind of matrix has this form? What's the name of this? No? What? Yes, it's positive definite, very good. And uh, so what's, the, what's this class of matrix is known as? This is a gram matrix. Did you ever heard of gram matrices? Yes, lovely. So gram matrices, it, it's just a generalization of what it means to square a scalar to the space of matrices. It's literally just squaring it. And uh, they have a bunch of funny properties. The main one is that if I have, so J is called the gram, um, the gram factor of the gram matrix. So it turns out that if I build the matrix K equal to J daga J, which has the shape of number of uh, samples by number of samples, okay, these K and S share the same non-zero eigenvalues, okay? Why? The proof is very simple. If I take the S to D decomposition, decomposition of J, which is U sigma V daga, okay, where sigma is a diagonal matrix with the singular values of J, well, S is nothing over than uh, U sigma U U daga sigma no, U, pardon, V daga, V sigma U daga, V V daga is unitary, so it gives you the identity and you get U sigma square U daga, while K does the same thing, only that they get V sigma V U daga, U sigma V daga, which therefore gives me V sigma square V daga. Okay, so you see, I have the same singular values. Is it clear? Only that this one has more, one of the two has more singular values. Essentially, in a sense, it's telling you, if, if this matrix is a gram matrix and the gram factor has, is number of samples by number of parameters, of course, I can have at most uh, the smallest dimension of non-zero eigenvalues, and the others are all zeros, right? So also it means that the rank of S is bounded. It's given at most by whatever J, what is the rank of J. So can I exploit this property that S and K have the same eigenvalues? Well, it turns out that yes, I can. So you see, let's say that I want to operate my neural networks in the many parameters regime. But I can keep fixed the number of samples because the sampling is efficient. The gradient has this noise that is those variants that is going down as I converge. So I would just want to use my, my algorithm with many parameters. To do that, it means I cannot invert this JJ Daga matrix, the S matrix, or the geometric tensor in our language, but I want to invert this K matrix, which machine learning people love to call the neural tangent kernel. I, I will not tell you why. I want to invert it, but how do I do that? Well, there exists a lovely property, which I don't remember the name, but maybe someone remembers. Do you remember? I mean, no, okay. Which allows me to rewrite this expression as j, j daga j to the minus one times epsilon. Okay, what does it mean? I take my vector of uh, local energies, I build this K, the neural tangent kernel, so this J daga J matrix, and I invert it. But now this matrix is number of samples by number of samples. So even if I have millions of parameters, this I can still invert, assuming I have few samples, and then I simply multiply by J. Okay? Is it clear? Yes? Sorry? I, yes, I will show you in a second. This is a linear algebra property. And literally, people did papers, like there are two papers around, one by someone in the audience, about this step, which might seem very stupid. But without this, uh, we were blocked by this cubically increasing cost uh, of inverting this geometric tensor or S matrix. And now we can just invert the K matrix, OK? And this really unleashes 
allows us to use huge networks for those problems. And so what happens here is that, so how do we do? I cannot prove exactly, I can prove you that they're identical. So the, the proof is something like that. I use the SPD decomposition and I shove it inside of this expression. So J, J daga minus one uh, times J epsilon. If I shove in the, the decomposition, I get, well, um, wait a moment. Well, this is just the S matrix, so I decompose it like that, so it's U sigma square U daga minus one. Is it what I want to do? I think so, yes. And here I get J epsilon, so J is uh, U sigma V daga times epsilon. And now what I can do is, well, U is unitary, so I can essentially, I can invert this, this term here, and I can get U sigma minus U, U daga, U sigma V daga epsilon. Is it clear to everyone? Because U is unitary, sigma is diagonal. So a unitary matrix, so if you take the inverse of this, you can just take the transpose and invert every individual matrix and this U, like it just, it's unitary, so the U daga is equal to U and sigma is diagonal, so you just take the inverse of its diagonal element. So now U daga U is the identity. We love unitary matrices. And this is in a sense the pseudo inverse, I'm being a bit sloppy, but essentially get U sigma minus one V daga epsilon. Okay, and now you can do the same calculation for the second expression here. I have no space. So I can take J, J daga J to the minus one epsilon, and this becomes, right, I, I do the same substitution. J daga J, I had written and erased it here, and so I get something that looks like J is U sigma V daga, and here I have, instead of U sigma square U daga, I have V sigma square V daga minus one epsilon. I do the same trick as before. I invert this object, and I get U sigma V daga V sigma minus two V daga epsilon. This is, the unit, this is a unitary matrix, so I get U sigma minus one V daga epsilon. Okay, and therefore the two expressions are identical. This relation also has a norm that I don't remember, but I can check later, and has a beautiful Wikipedia page. So the, someone created a Wikipedia page for this before we did a paper about it, which makes the fact that there are two papers about it even more funny because we just didn't notice for a very long time. Okay, so this is super important because now we can just build this S matrix Again, we sample, we just build it. Just that now, instead of summing over the number of samples, we will be, the, this K matrix instead is some sum over the parameters. It doesn't matter. It, we can do it, right? We, we compute the Jacobian, etc. And I think it's very beautiful to see what Marcus Heil and Auchan did in that paper. And, um, so it's the, the plot to the right, if you want here. Okay, forget the labels, which are wrong. I think this is the Heisenberg model, but okay. So we compare, so you see the y-axis of the plot at the center is the relative error of the energy that they find when they converge with imaginary time evolution algorithm to the ground state, compared with respect to some exact solutions. This is a, Luciano, help me. Heisenberg 10 by 10, no? Okay, thank you. Luciano is one of the author of one of the two papers, so if you have questions, you can ask him. Um, so essentially, in this plot, so there are 100 spins in this thing, yeah? and they tried with a restricted Boltzmann machine first, you see, so this is a one, lay, one hidden layer neural network, you see, and they're increasing the number of parameters. And at convergence, this improves the error a bit, but not so much. Then they tried a convolutional neural network with mean SR, which is the name they give to this algorithm, where basically instead of doing S to the minus one F, they are doing this, they are inverting the neural tangent kernel. I just like to call it stochastic reconfiguration because mathematically it's equivalent, but okay, this is another war of uh, terminology. 
it doesn't really matter, I think. Like mean SR or SR with the neural tangent kernel, however you want to call it, they had a very beautiful idea. Because you can see that now they are able to go beyond the, the, like go to several thousands of parameters. Now, even if you could technically invert this matrix, like they're much faster. Because they have some, a few thousand parameters, so instead of having an algorithm that has to invert like 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, we just inverted 1,000 by 1,000 or something. And you can see that they were able to get to 10 to minus 7 relative error. And if you use single precision for your calculation, you could argue this is numerical precision. Okay? So this paper had a very beautiful title, which is uh, like reaching numerical precision with neural quantum states. So I want to stress that this is one of the best calculations, and then Luciano here uh, actually did something very similar um, using a transformer. So basically, they took a very much more complicated neural network inspired by what is done in, in uh, like for image analysis, and this is a vision transformer. We attached uh, some, uh, I think you attached a Boltzmann machine at the end, right, or some extra readout layer, yes, that's correct. And uh, you can see the result here. So this is what they call the deep bit, which is funny because one of the authors called the Vitteritti, so it seems as if he, he called the neural network to himself, but they tell me it's not the case. And uh, with uh, 200,000 parameters, which otherwise would be completely hopeless with other techniques, they were able to get probably the best energy on this, on this problem, the J1, J2 model, okay? So if you want, this is really state of the art, it's also quite recent. If you want to compute ground state energies, you can use those algorithms and they kind of work. The hardest part is getting the sampling right, the neural network architecture right, which I will quickly discuss now in the last 15 minutes. But you can do that. You can also try to do real-time dynamics with those algorithms simply by substituting in, in, in this equation instead of like an I here. As I said before, instead of doing imaginary time, the same equation almost unchanged hold for real-time dynamics. However, if you remember, I said before that all those sampling, extracting those sampling formulas from here only works if we have no nodes, if the wave function is never zero, okay? When I'm looking for the ground state, I'm kind of going down the landscape of the energy, and even if those equations are slightly wrong, I don't care too much. As long as I'm going roughly in the right direction, that's okay, right? Because I have some sort of fixed point in my dynamics, I'm converging there, I'm getting there, and as long as I go about in the right direction, well, I will just fix it later at the next iteration. For dynamics, I cannot do that because I care about the state at every point in time, because I don't have a fixed point, instead errors will accumulate. And so the fact that I have this issue will make it such that your dynamics, the more nodes you have in your wave function, the more error it will accumulate. And last summer, with Alessandro Sinibaldi and a bunch of other people, we wrote a paper about that, called Unbiasing Time-Dependent Variational Principle, where we really studied this problem, we showed that it's actually a problem, that was not really discussed before. And we discussed how we can avoid this whole differential equation which we do not know how to solve without this, this bias term to do the dynamics. And I, unfortunately, I would need another, uh, let's say, another two hours to discuss it, but there's another class of algorithms that we propose for the dynamics which rely on writing this as an optimization problem itself. So every time step, you can solve an optimization problem to find the state at the next step and you do this recursively many times, instead of having just to invert the matrix. But I will not discuss it. So in the last 10 minutes, I would like to discuss the other very important thing, which is, I've shown you how to do ground state. I have shown you how to do ground state with big networks. You can also use those algorithms to compute excited states. In some cases, you could, for example, add a, a penalty term to the energy that, that asks you to be orthogonal to some states that you find before. I would now like to tell you something about the neural networks that we use. So, what do we use? Yes. Well, Luciano's answer, in a sense, is to say, and Ricardo, who maybe is also in the room, um, is to say we can always take those complicated big neural networks from the literature of uh, computer science and use it for our 
scopes. And this is true. However, we kind of like and we often want to also include some knowledge about physics and about the structure of the problem. So for example, most lattice Hamiltonians we deal with as some sort of lattice symmetries, like translational symmetries, right? So regardless of the neural network that you choose, you would, if you find a good solution, your neural network will, uh, realize, will learn in a sense uh, to give you some translational invariant solution, right? Because your solution is translational invariant or equivalent. So why does it need to learn it and why can't you enforce it? And that, that's something quite important. So what we, what we started doing at some point was to say, well, I can always use some arbitrary non-symmetric neural network X, right? And if I want to symmetrize it, I simply, so if I want to build a symmetrized neural network, what I can do is simply take, like I use Psi, but this you can think of it as a neural network in a sense or state. I can simply take like the group of symmetries I care about, so for example, the translations, and now I can evaluate my non-symmetrized neural network for all the translations of my state, okay? So to say it in simpler words, that maybe it's easier to understand. Let's say I have some non-symmetric neural network that knows nothing about symmetries. What I can do is to, create, to construct something that is symmetric, I can, every time I evaluate, I don't know, for some up, down, up, up configuration, I simply evaluate it for all the I don't know, 1D, permuta 1D translations, if I have some system that is periodic over 1D translations. So I could evaluate my non-symmetric network for up, down, up, up, of course, which is basically T, G0, if you want, is the identity. When I evaluate for T, G1, which basically just permutes, like translates by one my entry, so I have down, up, up, up. Then I have another evaluation where I permute by two, right? TG two. So basically I get um, up, 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 down, and then the last one, which is up, up, down, up. Is it clear? This I can always do as long as the representation of this symmetry group is polynomial in my space, because if I start to have an exponentially larger representation, of course, it becomes too expensive. It's still expensive, because if, if this group is like the group of translations in a 2D lattice, uh, like the size of this group uh, grows somehow as L squared, right? Because I have L, tra permutation, L translations along one axis in 2D, I have L translations on the other axis, so this is L squared. So this is not the ideal technique to use, right? This I can always use. This is beautiful because I can symmetrize anything, like whatever neural network any random kid on the block writes. I mean, maybe kids in 10 years will write neural networks on the, with chalk on, on the street. But okay, uh, so whatever neural network you consider, you can always use this, which is beautiful. But it's a bit expensive. So what uh, Marcus, Marcus, Ao, and other people started doing is to say, well, let's try to be smarter about it. There are some neural networks that are already permutationally equivariant according to some symmetries, like convolutional networks. They already are equivariant according to translations, right? Because you have this convolution kernel and you translate it over your full matrix. So I don't need to encode the translations this way, because if I take a convolutional network, this is already translationally equivariant. So, but a convolutional network doesn't know, for example, how to do like a, a mirror symmetry or a point group symmetry, so all the rotations of the full lattice. Do you, do you understand why? Is it clear? Good. So essentially they said, if I, have, if I have a group, if my symmetries are given by two groups, one is the point group, so like mirror symmetries, rotations, and one is like translations. What I can do is I can take, I can only do this sum over the point group, 
The point group is the mirror and the rotations, which do not grow with the system size, because I have simply, in 2D, I have two mirror symmetries and four rotations, right? So this doesn't grow with the system size, and here I take a convolutional network, which is translationally equivalent, and whose cost doesn't grow as I increase the system size. So now I have a neural network architecture that is constructed starting from a convolutional network, but at the same time is symmetrically equivariant under translation and invariant under the point group, okay? So this architecture worked very well. Um, what Ricardo and uh, Luciano did in this paper here of a transformer, of a vision transformer, they said, this is a vision transformer. So it's made to pick up very long range correlations, like very important task to be performed by vision transformers is know if there are cats and dogs in the pictures and whether cats and dogs love or, or hate each other. So the vision transformer must be able to relate the cats and dogs in the picture. So let's say sets of pixels that are very far apart. But in physics, at least in the kind of Hamiltonians we look for, at least if I have local interactions, I would expect some sort of more short range interactions or some translational invariance. So what they did was some smart uh, approach. They took like this multi-head attention, so one small part of a network, and they tried to inject some uh, domain-specific knowledge about physics to make it such that this blob, this part of a network, makes the network respect some physical properties related to environment. And if you want to know more, ask him. And their approach, their idea was to change as little as possible this network. Because what works, don't break it, right? Something like that. I think. Um, yes. There's many other architectures that have been tried. I will just throw at you one last architecture before uh, I let you go, which is uh, very quickly. how we can deal with uh, uh, fermions, because people also love fermions, right? It's where the money is nowadays because materials have fermions and chemistry is made of fermions. So, very quickly, how can you build uh, some fermionic ansatz, right? In a sense, how do you make a neural network that is uh, permutationally invariant? So let's assume that I'm parameterizing now, instead of a spin model, I have my neural network that takes as in, my wave function takes as input the positions of a set of electrons, okay? Those are real space positions, right? So, in a sense, I would like this to be permutationally, permutationally antisymmetric. What's the simplest way to make something that is permutationally antisymmetric? Someone? Right. Yes to take as later determinant, right? Like a very simple approach to do this would be to take the determinant of some set of single particle orbitals, x1, right? This is like kind of like the mean field or the product state uh, that is anti-symmetric. Of course, this doesn't encode any quantum correlation beyond what is enforced by anti-symmetry. Right? Is this right and clear? I use the determinant because essentially, if I write out the determinant, let's say for, for a two-particle si two particle system, if I have x1 and phi2 of x2 and phi, no, phi1 of x2 and phi2 of x1 and phi, Chu of x2, the determinant is simply phi1 of x1, phi2 of x2, minus phi2 of x1, phi1 of x2, right? And this is anti-symmetric, because if I swap the two, I get a minus sign. And so the determinant is simply a generalization to arbitrary number of particles of this object. So if I see this later determinant as some sort of, let's say, um, mean field state, okay, 
how, where I can inject a neural network that such that I don't break the symmetry, <coughs> the anti-symmetry of the later determinant, but, but that I can represent more general states. What would you do? Like, come on, someone. Where can you inject something parameterized that you don't know what it is, uh, but that you could use to learn something interesting about the system? What do you mean? Here? Here? Okay, yes, I could parameterize phi with a neural network, that's very good. However, what I will get is simply I will be changing the one particle, uh, the single particle orbital. So I will be able to get very good single particle physics, but I'm not able to represent something that is uh, like where I have uh, many body correlations. Someone else? Indeed, but in general, this means I need to get exponentially many determinants. This is something I could do. But something where there is a magic object I can put, if I only knew it, that allows me to still maintain some polynomially expensive structure. So let me ask you another question. Can I always express the ground state of an Hamiltonian as a product state? No, why not? Why not? Yes. You said no, why not? Indeed, but is this a, a general statement? I, can't I just take a rotation and go in a basis where it is separable? So you can always take a rotation to a basis, I, just that you don't know what rotation it is, but there is always a rotation to a basis that gives you a separable, separable ground state. In a sense, if you diagonalize the Hamiltonian, you're kind of doing that. And your ground state is just like something trivial, right? So in a sense, what I could do is I could say, instead of taking this later determinants on those coordinates, I could say, well, I perform a unitary rotation here, and I evaluate my Slater mean like product state, but on some modified coordinates, okay? Now, this is a unitary thing, it's very complicated, I don't know how to write it, I have no idea. So it's a perfect candidate to be expressed as a neural network. And now, phi is an exponentially large object, like it lives in the Hilbert space. So I don't want to apply u to the right, I want to apply it to the left. That's a very bad arrow. But because in a sense, I want to have some u of x1, xn, I want to change those coordinates to do this, okay? And so what happens in practice is that here, I can do, I can do this transformation where instead of having phi1 of x1, I will have now phi1 of, let's say, x1, for example, or not even, f1 of x1, xn, and then phi1 of uh, fn of x1, xn, and here I have phi n of f1 of x1, xn, etc. So you see, I still have the same single particle orbitals, which as you proposed before, can be parameterized with some neural network, and that's what we do in practice. But also, instead of making them depend on a single coordinate, I make it depend on all the coordinates through a transformation. Well, this transformation must respect this property that like, I have the first output like, on the first column, second output on the second column, so it's still permutationally anti-symmetric, but in some over field in some other basis, which I don't even know what it is. And actually, in practice, what we do, we simply do this. Um, no, we do exactly that, sorry. So that's what we do, okay? So this technique, this approach, is called the backflow, Slater backflow. And, uh, um, okay, there's a bunch of other details that I'm not discussing, but you can look at a bunch of papers. So it's a very old technique. Everything I talked to you about today was since many, many, 
decades. But the most recent reformulation in terms of neural networks, uh, it's due to Brian Clark and Di Luo. It's a physical review letters of a few years ago, but if you just Google for neural backflow, you will find it. And uh, it's very powerful. Turns out that it's very general and can represent an arbitrary state. Now, of course, you need to learn this backflow transformation. And, but if you find it, you can diagonalize the problem. So this is one approach to do fermions, and there's another approach which is called the hidden fermions, which is a bit more complicated, but builds on a very similar idea. And uh, you can also look at that paper by Antoine Georges and uh, uh, Javier Robledo Moreno, which was his PhD student at Flatiron Institute and Columbia University, I think. Okay, so again, like the message I would like to transmit is that I didn't write any neural network today. I just showed one, but I didn't do myself. Because in the end, what you need to think about is that neural networks, we leave them to computer scientists to tell us what are the good architectures. What we want to do is to just inject little layers, in a sense, that inject our physical knowledge of the system. So here, you can think of this later determined as some sort of permutationally anti-symmetric layer that I shove at the end of my network architecture to ensure it. Pretty much as the approach I showed you before of summing over all the symmetry group, which you could think of some sort of, um, um, of some uh, uh, data augmentation approach if you want, because you evaluate many times the network, you can think of this object, uh, of this sum as, uh, uh, you can think of it as sort of as a first layer that you do, that just evaluates your networks and then you sum at the end of the rule. So, like, the way you sh I, I, I tend to think about and I tend to reason about those neural network quantum state, I, I do not believe that a neural network can do a better job than a physicist alone. Actually, there is a very funny paper that came out some time ago where some researchers showed that for a particular Hamiltonian with a, with a completely anti permutationally anti-symmetric ground state, using just a Boltzmann machine, so a random a general neural network that is not anti-symmetric, they were showing that they could never find the ground state. And then other researchers showed that if you do this kind of construction, so if you make your neural network permutation anti-symmetric, you can find it very efficiently. So you see, you need both efforts. You need the physicists to put all the hard stuff, so anti-symmetries, symmetries, etc. but then there are things that we do not know how to write very well. This unitary rotation is pretty much akin to understanding the perturbative structure and the perturbative expansion of the ground set of your system. And it's super hard to understand it, to know it, to write it analytically. So what do we do? We just try to identify small blobs, small rotations, small, small features that we can parameterize, and then we try to train neural networks to do that. And so with that, I would like to thank you for listening to me for so many hours today. Um, on Friday, there will be a little tutorial where uh, you, I will give you a notebook and you can essentially write down a code that does this variational Monte Carlo optimization for the ground states uh, using pullbacks and push forwards and everything you need. Also doing natural gradient descent, which there will not be enough time for you to do, but you can bring it home and do it whenever you want. And uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>